Now, first of all, I wish to start by thanking my friend Diego Bravar for having invited me to chair this session, Research for Health and Wellbeing. I wonder whether I should be using English or Italian. Now, given that most uh, speakers uh, are Italian, I will use Italian and maybe I use English uh, in uh, introducing Katarina from. Our school is an international school, so I'm going instead uh, to use Italian. I was thinking this morning, possibly, this is going to be my last contribution as director of CISA here in Trieste, not abroad, but here in Trieste. So it is also an opportunity for me, if you allow me, to summarize what CISA has been doing over the last few years. Six, uh, the last six years when I have been director of CISA as an introduction to our topic. But I'd like to start from the words used in the uh, declaration for the press conference to promote, connect, innovate, and evolve. I find it a beautiful summary of how of how we should move towards innovation, uh, move starting in the lab and going on to applied research and the success of a product, and then again further on to leadership especially innovate and evolve, reminds me of Darwinian uh, evolution. As you know, Darwinian evolution is based on the fact that randomly we look uh, uh, for hints in the evolutionary process and then uh, the selection by the environment identify the fittest uh, to survive. So. This is a process, this is a virtuous process that allows us to evolve, as Darwin found out. But this is a virtuous um, process for companies as well. I have just 10 minutes available, so I don't want to go on with my introduction. Actually, I have to give a few minutes to my co-chair, Paolo Colli Franzoni, from the Institute for the Management of Innovation and Healthcare in Turin. And then we will have various presentations. Very briefly, on my institutions, which I represent here, but I'd like to start from the topic of this session. Bravar, in his introduction, mentioned the Friuli Venezia Giulia as a strong innovator, according to the European Union. If you go over and above the result and you look at data, it, it is very interesting. While Diego was talking, I, I unloaded uh, the data from the European Union, which show that we are really ranking uh, uh, among the first in Europe in terms of scientific production in Europe and in Italy, but also in terms of scientific quotations. We have a factor higher than 10 uh, versus Europe. So that's the parameter that actually uh, increase the relevance of this region in the scientific domain. I'm not being deliberately provocative, I'm just reading data. Yeah. 
because I'm perplexed. The world of the academia and of research over the years has shown that it is not capable to translate this powerful knowledge uh, in terms of research into innovation. This has not happened. And that's instead, uh, that's what would, would be necessary to create innovative startups. Now, starting from this uh, criticism, I'm going to tell you what we've been doing at CISA over the last uh, six years. We had a problem with interpreting what it meant for a school dedicated to basic research, that of having an, of an office for transfer of technology. Thanks to the engineer mathematician Gianluigi Rozza, we created a language and we called it the Science for Industries. Gianluigi and I, we have been using it for years now. And we changed the name of this center because CISA doesn't handle transfer. We are not an engineering school. And the uh, office is now called Valorization, Valorization of our talent, uh, which is researched all over the world. It, the P, our PhD candidates it is known, work on 95% of the times outside research domain. Just, this is uh, what I discussed with Diego uh, with our meetings in Confindustria to understand what we were dealing with. So, socially, the impression one has of a PhD candidate is, is different from what happens in real life. 90% of them they does not finish their career in academia. Maybe they start there, but then they move to industry. So our idea was that of bringing together these talents with different solutions from academia, because some might have made a different choice already at the beginning of their careers. In these five years, beyond the innovative uh, projects we had with uh, Confindustria for PMIs, small and medium enterprises, SMEs, there have been awards and acknowledgements whereby the issues selected by the companies were uh, analyzed by our researchers. And at the end of these two projects, we had a wide bro wider one finalized for the port, which led to creation, the setting up of a couple of companies and the PhD candidates being hired by said companies. Five new spin-offs were created CISA had not created uh, new spin-offs spin in 20 years. Five in medicine, the last one was set up in the past months, Boland Therapeutics, and three in the data sector. It was the data sector that convinced me to make an even greater effort taking advantage of the financing of the Project for Excellence Department, we created a science group, a research group in data science. And we're going to have the director Diton with what we do this, Pinton with uh, what we do here in Udine and Trieste. We had a memorandum of understanding with Generali, ICTP and MIB, and the news we've received these days have been encouraging, but I can't disclose more. And I hope we're going to 
arrive to leave something in this field too. We have a CISO with PhD uh, candidates in the industry, Electrolux, Fincantier, Monte Carlo Yacht and others. And we have a, f a video with a collaboration with the University of Trieste in Dubai. We are also present in European networks for technological innovation and PhD training. This is a summary without being going too much in depth. What is the message from all this? Even institution like CISA, and then we're going to have the other speaker, speakers um, with their opinions, which is dedicated to basic research, cannot look at the world which is out there and dedicate a part of its research, but not only its research, but its innovative capacity to promote and make the first step towards innovation. I will be concluding by underlying the context nowadays, and especially one aspect, the, the National Plan of Recovery and Resilience, and the 12 ecosystems in the region which are foreseen by the recovery. Shortly, the calls will come out in the following days, I reckon, I'm wondering if the region isn't interested in participating in this call on ecosystems, which are actually on any given topic. A topic from the region could be bio-high-tech bio and health or innovation, but notwithstanding the topic, I believe it is paramount I'm saying this at the end of my mandate, to take advantage and, and the region must be present for this call. The terms will be made known shortly, but some news have arrived. For example, the number of centers, the number of ecosystems for, e for innovation and technology, 12, uh, not exactly matching the number of reasons. We are a small region and I think the only chance is for us to find allies and partners. This is the message that I would like to launch and I hope it will be heard. I'm going to give the floor to Paolo. We have two of them actually. We call it Franzoni and one Paolo Gasparini. In order to recoup the delay, I had a speech, and I would like to keep it for the end so that we can recoup a bit. We can actually go directly to the speakers, so we're going to be very punctual, very Austrian-Hungarian-like. We're going to leave time for the parallel session, if you agree. Paolo Gasparini, yes, who is connected remotely. He is director for the University Clinical Department of Medical, Surgical and Health, University of Trieste. We are sorry we can't echo. Now we go. Now, I'm here with you to give you an idea of what the University of Trieste is doing in the field of research. I'll try and be brief and to reach the goal to make up for the slightly late that we have accumulated. The former School of Medicine, which is now the biomedical area of the University of Trieste, comprising various departments, is very busy in the field of research, biomedical research in particular, with a special focus, which is that of uh, accuracy medicine, started with omics, uh, regardless of whether it is metabolomics or proteomics. The use 
as a consequence of big data. And together with our mathematicians and IT uh, engineers, we are developing machine learning systems with special attention also being paid to the development of uh, innovative th therapies. And this is being done in collaboration with the Mother and Child Hospital in Trieste, where for uh, pediatric patients we are developing, uh, we are further developing our clinical research uh, department for pediatric patients, which is one of the greatest efficiency and criticalities that we have uh, uh, when we develop innovative drugs. Uh, regardless of whether they are uh, new drugs or old ones. We never have the pediatric formulation. This has been recognized by the research ministry that has uh, financed our biomedical sciences uh, department as an excellent department, which is shown also by an increasing number of uh, PhD students. Uh, our university, of course, has uh, as its mission, the training of uh, PhD students. We have 131 of them in between molecular medicine and neurosciences. They are included in all the various sectors that I mentioned before. The results are uh, significant and 15 professors of our university, 15 professors are among uh, the top uh, uh, scientists and seven of them are top scientists for the clinical areas. Now, the University of Trieste is the arriving point for various types of uh, cooperations with CISA, where there is a very strong relation with CISA or with Aya Science Park or the University of Udine with the Mother and Child Hospital in Trieste, with a whole system of, of and the whole network of research, research organizations here in the region. Of course, these forms of collaborations are also part of a wider international framework uh, because international collaboration was uh, strengthened uh, due to uh, COVID, due to the pandemic. The University of Trieste on PubMed is present with 54 publications within uh, different forms of international collaboration uh, having to do with COVID. We are also integral part of a virtuous process of transferring research from the lab to practice through our uh, through our health system in the region, thanks to the contribution of, of professors and all facilities and structures that create a bridge in between our university and the local hospitals, in particular the Maggiore and Catinara hospitals and the mother and child uh, hospital, Burlo Garofalo. Uh, to stimulate the debate, in this session, I'd like to tell you about certain uh, situations that might actually be considered criticalities. And uh, I think that we should really exploit the opportunity to patent uh, our uh, discoveries. Now, the pandemic has incredibly encourage the setting up of international consortia, very wide, some of them. Uh, sometimes there were hundreds and hundreds of researchers involved in this consortia, which makes it difficult, which makes it difficult to try and understand uh, how to patent uh, certain discoveries uh, uh, because patent offices then are, are all over the world and, and, and we need uh, a harmonization of rules uh, for patent. And then there is another important aspect. We 
the pandemic has uh, encouraged the data sharing. Many data, even before being published, uh, are available on Med Archive, and they are available for each and every one of us. And therefore, we feel that we don't know who's uh, uh, using this data, and, and we lose control of, of their priority. The whole of which is even worsened by an attitude, an attitude that we've seen over time. Editors do request, even before a paper is published, they do insist on data to be shared on international platforms. So there are cooperation between private and public partners, and even before publishing a paper, they have to deposit their data in uh, uh, international platforms uh, that are accessible to all researchers, which has an impact, an economic impact on research activities, but also an impact on the protection of research results. Now, practically, for us, uh, open access and sharing of data, which are fundamental to disseminate new ideas, uh, have a cost. Uh, 2.5 uh, uh, thousand, 3,000 uh, euro for publication, multiplied by the number of paper, means that we really have to spend an enormous sum of money to publish our data on an open uh, access source. And that's become an item when we ask uh, uh, for money uh, to, uh, to our investors. And there is one last element that I'd like to quote, and it has to do with innovative treatments. When we talk about innovative treatments for rare diseases, and we are directly involved, to encourage and promote research on rare diseases, both the FDA and EMA are helping through the orphan drug designation, which extends for a further 10 years the protection on that product. But we often talk about very innovative techniques, uh, cell techniques, uh, uh, genic uh, therapies, oligo antisense therapies, uh, which can become ra very rapidly obsolete. But for 10 years, we have uh, uh, this, this, this stop. And uh, on the one hand, it protects the developer. But on the other, uh, you have to demonstrate a clinical superiority on novelties. But in the case of rare diseases, this is practically impossible because when you have just a few tens of patients, it's difficult to um, ask them to undergo further clinical trials, even if a new drug has been found. So, and I close. The University of Trieste is the center, as it were, of a um, incredible number of theses. We have many, many students enrolled. And again, uh, ethical committees involved in approving of uh, the dissertation's uh, uh, subjects uh, have uh, uh, an impact on our institution. I'd like to conclude here, and I thank you for having given me the opportunity to tell you more about the University of Trieste in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, are we going to have questions right now or remarks? Are there urgent questions or requests for clarifications? Or we might group them, group them at the end. Roberto Pinton, Rector of the University of Udine. I think we should have a presentation a PowerPoint presentation. Well, I wish to thank the organizers, and in particular, 
Diego Brava for his invitation. I really also wish to thank uh, our local authorities. In their welcoming speech, uh, speeches, they were really challenging in inviting us to do more. First of all, taking the floor after Professor Gasparini, I wanted to quote a few examples of what the University of Udine has been doing over the last few years in reacting to certain suggestions as well. We are part of those 2,000 researchers working here in Friuli Venezia Giulia mentioned by Diego Brava before. We have eight departments. Of course, when we talk about health and well-being, it's mainly the department, the medical department that's involved Undoubtedly, however, and you see uh, those yellow dots, there are strong interactions are being developed because we believe that there is a need for multidisciplinary actions uh, um, adopted by different uh, domains. Shall I control my PowerPoint presentation? Uh, one of the most important topics is healthy aging. And actually, Stefano, we don't know exactly uh, which approach will be chosen, but healthy aging is certainly one of the domain where we uh, might uh, uh, play an important role. Our medical department right now does not just work on healthy aging, but our approach is that of uh, working within all these uh, fields over and above the usual research activity, um, training and cooperation with the uh, University of Trieste. Now, we have important facilities and I'd like, uh, last year I was talking about the same uh, uh, slide, but it was a rendering last year. Now, uh, this facility has been completed. Uh, we have important facilities like the biobank, the animal enclosure, the microbiology facility, and other activities too. And this facility will be mainly devoted to healthy aging. Uh, this facility is available uh, for uh, for the region to, to uh, launch various activities. Oh, and then we have technological platforms, genomics, bioinformatics, uh, IT, and then I will enter uh, more into the details of AI and machine learning, cell cultures and metabolic analysis, including organoids. And this is rather interesting, the fact that there is a European project where we are involved uh, which is break and med, and we can use these this fake cells to treat cancer, and then confocal microscopy and nanoscopy, which means that we need technologies, technologies to perform uh, research, but also to do our clinical uh, everyday activities. But one thing I think was very clear to us in other words, the idea that active aging and healthy aging should not confine to the medical domain only. Actually, we wanted to involve uh, other disciplines. And this is what we have achieved uh, through the cooperation among these four areas, prevention and wellness, infrastructures and technologies, translational research, diagnostic clinics and assistance, and welfare for inclusive societies and communities. What did we do? Well, we developed joint programs that have to be financially supported. Uh, we um, received financing from the European Regional Development Fund, but I wanted to mention this project in particular because uh, 
this project has been supported by Fondazione Friuli, which is a bank. Uh, it is one of our supporters. And here, we group to ver uh, together various researchers, about 100 of them, uh, coming from almost all the eight departments of our university to study physical, mental and social frailty in the elderly. And this is a world phenomenon, uh, but even in our region, uh, aging of the population is, is very much felt. And we have developed a work, work packages. And I believe that this is one of the major challenges. In other words, trying to group together various skills to develop a system which is really useful for our community, not limited to medical treatment only. Uh, over and above dissemination, the use of be best practices by the region, and the region might further enlarge this uh, project, it is important to see that as a spin-off from this project, another project was developed, a, a project which was then developed by the uh, Ministry for Research and University. This is a systemic approach platform based, of course, on artificial intelligence and machine learning to develop new approaches for the assessment, uh, early assessment of cases which are likely to become severe in the case of COVID. And once the foundations were laid, when the emergency came up, we tested it on COVID. We're not always uh, intervening uh, after an emergency. Sometimes we are able to act in advance as Professor Gasperini was mentioning, this is another example of how technology can be helpful. And it is the computer guided repair of the orbital floor. Here we have a 3D simulation to foresee how these surgeries should be performed, which simplifies the initial approach, but also provides greater certainty to physicians, to surgeons, to achieve uh, the result that they want to achieve. This is uh, the simulation center. We developed this system together with the uh, local health uh, agency. We developed the simulation center where we perform training not just experiments, and thanks to AI, we can now resort to uh, virtual reality, uh, thereby reproducing uh, an emergency situation as well. I'm quoting uh, from the activities of the same group, starting from telemedicine, when a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship patient-physician was impossible to achieve because all our physicians were busy in fighting COVID, we created uh, virtual uh, rooms, you see them on the right, and we could uh, work with our patients that were to undergo surgery. It's a kind of semiology. And this, again, is, is a research project that has received adequate funding. The goal is that of developing a prototype of an organizational method based on telemedicine for maxillofacial uh, surgery. But this model could be easily expanded to other sectors. So as you see, emergency provides us with the opportunity of doing more. This is a project which is currently under evaluation within the, uh, the Horizon Europe program. We've often mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
maybe because COVID gave uh, mathematicians and IT engineers the possibility to work more intensely. So uh, a, a predictive model has been developed for uh, the patient's fate based on certain observations. This is the theory and this is the validation attempt. Actually, it is 10 European hospitals, uh, 1,861 patients. The idea is that of being able to predict uh, whether uh, hospitalization is required or whether uh, mortality is expected. Now, physicians know very well that we just can't rely on these algorithms, but in case of uh, saturations of intensive care units being uh, uh, all filled up, we might use this algorithm for a patient triage. And there below you have the experimental exercises, which I'm not going to quote because I'll be scared to death and I don't want to scare you either. Another possibility to use AI and machine learning has to do for the cytofluorometric tests of patients hospitalized for COVID-19 to assess lymphocyte and monocyte reactivity. It is a predictive model, but it also helps us in devising the treatment for those patients. So we can use these new inputs coming from other disciplines to reach an integral vision in the field of health. Another example, we were mentioning the Oncological Center in Aviano. We collaborate with the Oncological Center and the purpose here is to use artificial intelligence to predict uh, uh, mutations in tumor development and progression. The availability of IT platforms and especially technological platforms allows us to perform validations of uh, the storage of saliva-based uh, samples. Uh, for molecular screening or, and this I really wanted to show you, again this is an idea coming from a multidisciplinary approach, something we really have to insist on. Here we have a, uh, we, we have the topic of working safely with the pandemic. In other words, the need to balance the economic recovery and the protection of workers, and not just that. Uh, protection of workers' health, but also privacy and dignity. And here we have our um, legal school involved. I'd like to conclude simply by thanking you and reminding you that uh, now uh, PhD students and researchers uh, are, are working a lot, uh, great attention is being paid to their training, there is a major interaction between companies and academia, and this is precisely what we are doing together with all the other university and research institutions in the region. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Katarina Fromma, uh, Vice Rector uh, and uh, Professor of Chemistry at the University of Freiburg. Uh, you are muted, I, I, I think. No, I'm not, but... No, uh, yes, it's okay. Ah, it's okay, fine. good. <laughs> so, i share my slides. Should be working now. Let me know that's if you... That's fine, and we can see the slides. Okay, wonderful. So, buongiorno, good morning from Freiburg, where I join uh, via uh, this link. Um, I would like to present a little bit the University of Freiburg and the situation in medical uh, research and uh, uh, 
Uh, to start with, I would like to say that our university is a full university with five faculties, one of which is actually a faculty of sciences and medicine. This is a uniqueness in Switzerland that we have actually the two uh, uh, sciences, natural sciences on one hand and medicine together in one big faculty, which leads to a lot of collaborations between the natural sciences like biology, biochemistry, chemistry, physics, with medicine on the other hand. Overall, we have 11,000 students out of which, um, uh, and 2,000 researchers, out of which 280 are professors. From these 11,000 students, we have roughly 2,500 students at our Faculty of Sciences and Medicine. And while uh, two years ago, we were much more focused on research and a little bit less on tech transfer, we have recently renamed our vice rectorate into research and innovation, not only research. And this is one of my big tasks, actually, to uh, try to encourage our researchers to do a little bit more tech transfer and start up companies. And I will focus a little bit in that area um, of our medical research. Maybe to let you know a little bit about the funding situation in Switzerland, Typically, we have the Swiss National Science Foundation, which uh, funds basic research and use inspired research projects. And there is a second funding agency, which is called Inno Swiss. They are funding typically applied research between academia and industry, so projects where the two can work together. So this is uh, limited to uh, Swiss industries but it is easy if uh, um, foreign industries have a collaboration, for instance, in Switzerland to realize such collaborative projects. Then there are, of course, of other foundations like the Novartis Foundation, Gebert Ruiff Foundation, Mercato Foundation, which are all interested also in biomedical research and fund projects in these areas. We have, of course, also the direct private public partnerships uh, for mandated research and a number of ERC grants in our university. What are the strong research areas in uh, medtech? For instance, our university works on the next generation implants. So this can be hip implants, but also as we can see here, human artificial interfaces can be implants for the brain that can adapt actually to the brain structure that um, are hard upon insertion, but then they soften once they are implanted into the brain. We have a strong research ongoing e about eating disorders. Um, this is uh, interdisciplinary research uh, around uh, biology, medicine, but also psychology. So there is a very strong interdisciplinary research going in this area. Then we have a, a, a very strong research in cancer, typically early detection of breast cancer or colon cancer, for instance, where we look into biomarker detection. Uh, in terms of neurosciences, we have a very big center at the university, which also uh, uh, works with apes. So uh, we are doing cognitive studies, but also studies about multilingualism uh, with uh, human uh, species then, of course. Uh, Switzerland, uh, Freeburg has also a national center of competence and research. So those are the big national centers, uh, centers of excellence, if you wish. And our center of excellence is on bio-inspired materials. Uh, we will see a little bit more in a minute. Um, big data was mentioned already by the two speakers before me. And of course, also Freeburg is very strong in big data. And as I already mentioned, human uh, artificial intelligence interfaces. There is an institute called Human IST around this uh, research area. And there is also a very applied research lab about smart living, so future of living in, uh, in new houses, buildings, and so on. We have an upcoming initiative around food and agriculture, which was launched by the Canton of Freiburg, and to which the university, of course, also can contribute, for instance, by studying fermentation processes, plant protection, and uh, invasive species and how to control them. 
a couple of ERC grants that are currently ongoing uh, in our university. They are listed right here, and some of which are also uh, involved in biology and medical research. For instance, here we have molecular biophysics of cellular membranes um, by uh, Professor Stefano Bani. Then we have big data application by Professor Philippe Pudremoru. He is, for instance, um, looking at uh, radiographies from patients, trying to identify patterns to see whether a patient is prone to develop uh, lung cancer. And uh, there is also research going on sleep and sleeping disorders by uh, Professor Björn Rasch. And you see a couple of more which are not necessarily involved in, in medical um, research. Uh, there are a couple of startups and spin-offs at the University of Freiburg to foster this tech transfer. And uh, I have already mentioned the Smart Living Lab here, which is actually taking place together with the EPFL and the engineering school at, in Freiburg and the University of Freiburg. So it's a, it's a multiple school um, endeavor. We have the big data, society and privacy. We have here so social entrepreneurship ongoing. Um, and then um, startups like Atlas Photonics, they are um, building devices for photochemistry. Nuria is a, a startup company interested in digital therapeutics. We have LS Instruments, which is an analytical machine um, platform. And another example is the Swiss Integrative Center for Human Health, which was uh, funded a couple of years back as a start, uh, a spin off from the University of Fribourg. And I would like to present in particular this Swiss Integrative Center for Human Health in more details. So the university realized that there is a gap between the fundamental research on one hand and industry on the other hand, and decided to create this SISH, as we call it, as a kind of platform in between the two. And if you look at it, what they do today, what SISH does today is uh, tests for COVID-19 with a special knowledge about uh, uh, saliva pre treatment to detect uh, COVID. They have an academic research group. They have uh, co industrial collaborators. They offer R&D solutions to partners, both from industry and from academia, um, R&D programs as well, and innovation programs between academia and, and industry. And then there is a focus on smart diagnostic, um, also for uh, uh, spe specific care, for individual patients, so it's personalized care, if you wish, in this uh, area. So what are they offering? They have, for instance, an innovation platform that contains a materials facility with uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy, AFM, particle analytics platform. There is a bio facility with a P2 classified biolaboratory with proteomics, genomics, and a saliva biobank. Then there is a bioinformatics platform about artificial intelligence, where also the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics is um, playing a role. Uh, and this SIB is actually also shareholder of the SISH. Then we offer a couple of uh, tech transfer um, products like the Swiss company maker to help to make startups, the Swiss product maker, which is um, helping to develop a sellable product, and then also the Swiss innovation maker, which is actually helping to discover new products to be marketed later on. And as I mentioned, there is also a research group at the SISH, which is actually involved in the study on Alzheimer, in particular the, the um, finding, so uh, discovery of biomarkers in saliva that uh, allow to detect Alzheimer at a very, very early stage and therefore um, will help to, to treat it in a better way. So uh, the, the SISH uh, has a number of highly specialized um, employees, senior and uh, technicians. Um, so a lot of competences that come together in the center. 
Then there is the biomarker discovery um, field where uh, we are very, very strong with the SISH, um, a strong methodology that has been developed, very unique, uh, where also a patent has been de uh, deposited and uh, methodologies that were licensed. We have this non-invasive uh, uh, saliva testing uh, for COVID, but it works also for other, uh, for other illnesses. And of course, together with this artificial intelligence and biobank. Uh, overall, the SISH offers also services where industries can, for instance, rent a laboratory uh, and install themselves to use the um, equipment that the SISH offers. Just some examples, we are doing matrix mass test COVID tests, um, developing antiviral doorknobs. There is this patent on the pre-analytical treatment deposited in Italy. Um, there are saliva tests also for other illnesses like cardiovascular diseases and, uh, and some more projects ongoing as you can, you can see right here for the biomarker detection. Today, the SISH is not anymore uh, fully owned by the University of Fribourg, but we are now a private public partnership with BioValley from Trieste being uh, a main shareholder, but still University of Fribourg, University of Neuchâtel, the Hospital of Fribourg, the uh, Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics, Cardiocento in Ticino, Chino, and Ecole de la Source, which is a medical school, they are all minority shareholders and contribute all to the success of the SISH. So it's really uh, the, the area to develop common research and innovation projects. There's also a new product that we took over to the SISH from our new partner, uh, that is the chemo maker, which is a product uh, meant to be sold now in Switzerland, also to, for instance, hospitals and pharmacies in order to prepare um, medications for patients. Cantonal support uh, comes from different um, funders, for instance, the uh, Promotion Economique. Uh, then also there is Free Up, which helps entrepreneurs to succeed. There's a Mali Innovation Center nearby where a, a lot of uh, startups find their place. And there is also InnoSquare that can help to uh, launch new activities in form of startups. And of course, the Seed Capital Foundation, which helps and gives loans to start a startup. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I close here and of course, I'm ready to take questions in the chat or later on. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot uh, for this impressive uh, list of uh, achievements and activities. And uh, uh, I would, uh, since we are late, I would uh, pass to the next uh, speaker, Sandro Scandolo from ICTP. I think he's connected from uh, remote. Sì, buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti e a tutte. Eh. Would you like me to speak in English or Italian? Italian is predominant. Okay. First, I wanted to invite, thank you for the invitation from the organizers. I'm sorry that I'm online, but I wanted to be there in person, but we had a, um, a last minute, minute, minute from Elisa Bonetti, the minister, so we had to organize that. I'm going to speak on behalf of the ICTP, the Theoretical Physics Abdus Salam Center that many Triestini know. It's an international center that deals with fundamental research in the field of physics, mathematics, and related sciences, but it has special attention for topics that are discussed in this forum because as an international center, we are very attentive to the development goals that have been determined at the United Nations, so we work towards facing these challenges and objectives and goals. That amongst them, the um, advanced training, which includes, as you may know, 
of objectives that are quite concretely described, such as health, which is the third goal in the SDGs, which is about health and well-being. If you look at how they are listed in the SDGs, you can see that our 2D, strengthening the capacity of all countries, especially the countries, uh, developing countries, for national and global health. And I wanted to underline that we speak about capacity first and foremost, which is what the ICTP has done for many years and knows how to do in physics and mathematics, and which is the side of offering competence for developing countries in order for them to then face their issues. From this point of view, within our center, we have research departments for fundamental physics, but we have also created a unit which deals with science, technology, and innovation, and it's called science technology and innovation in order to deal with low-cost technology in order to face challenges which are connected to these aspects beyond, which is theoretical physics, mathematics and fundamental sciences. It's a group that collect, gathers various types of competence, or competences that come from particle physics, but also those from communication, which I have a very, we have a very strong group on the Internet of Things, wireless, and then the FAM lab, which you might know, and with, whom, with which we organized the Maker Fair, which was held last weekend here in Trieste. Be it, be it science in the fundamental sense um, or other types of scientists we know that can be contribute to the SDGs and they will be approved by the uh, United Nations General Uslambish. Uh, 2020 and 2023 will be the international years for uh, de uh, sustainable development to acknowledge that what is lies behind uh, development is a lot of science, a lot of technology, and a lot of innovation. I wanted to go back a bit to capacity to underline that recently we've had a strong acceleration. I'm talking about developing country and the impact in developing country countries regarding critical aspects. Uh, 10 and 15 years ago. One among them is the spread of, in, of the internet at, in every single sector. We, I had the possibility to travel extensively in Africa, in Southeast Asia and Latin America, and I can assure you, connectivity is better in these countries, sometimes better than Italy. With this, I want to open a technological perspective connected to medicine, which we could not imagine 10, 15, 20 years ago. The second revolution that is taking place and has great impact in technology and innovation in medicine is the availability of low-cost devices a revolution that is taking place quite ra rapidly in the last five or ten years and brought forward the development of commercial devices which require very little competence to be put together with very low costs which allow nowadays to measure items with very low costs. You can find these devices in developing co countries. The latest developments in machine learning within these devices 
we have time ML devices which are defined by their capacity to operate with very uh, low power and these power, this power can be offered also off-grid uh, by a solar panel or other sources of energy that not, do not require being connected to the grid as in and within their processor, they allow for extremely complex analysis on the field, on sensors that have a, a very low costs. So it's not a matter of computers. It's, it's the, an extreme situation of computers which are off-grid. In all of these, these developments, a lot of competence lies behind. And this is where the ICTP focuses. We organize courses, conferences, workshops, very specific ones, trying to develop projects in collaboration on, um, in Africa, for example, especially in Rwanda, where we have recently opened a partner institute, which is basically an institution that replicates all the activities or of the ICTP for Africa, where we try to develop comp capacity in, uh, in uh, measuring devices, IoT, Internet of Things, with research activities with direct impact in medicine. We are developing with Rwanda in measuring devising for prevention men monitoring of uh, devices, steam, steam monitoring to prevent mm -hmm, prevention maintenance of these devices. We have also developed, together with the researchers in Rwanda, non-invasive techniques to detect and monitor cholera in public water. There are tiny devices with optical measurements and internal mechanism for, from in artificial, in, in artificial intelligence, they manage to recognize whether there are bacteria in the water. FabLab has carried out various projects this uh, year on prototypes, in processes, prosthetics for the year, for hearing with an aesthetics point from an aesthetics point of view and we are going to print prosthetics for the year this is what i wanted to summarize our true challenge in as far as our mission is concerned that is to bring these te technologies in developing countries is that of capacity. It's not a matter of costs anymore, not one of infrastructure, which still exists, but it's not dominant. What we need nowadays in developing countries to keep up the pace with development, especially in medicine, is competence. And here we are working hard through organiza the organization of courses, we have been acknowledged by the International Communication um, Center for Training in this field of the IOU and big data. This is all from me. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Sandro. Eh, siccome diciamo siamo chiaramente in ritardo, però mancano ancora sei speakers. We are quite late. So I'm going to leave the questions for the end, and I will go for, forward with our next speaker, Fulvio Sbrojavaca, who is Director of Innovation in CL. And a member of the Presidential Council of Anitec. Good morning, everyone. Last year, We presented in this, uh, this event a white paper
My apologies. I thought it was turned on. Last year, Anitek presented a white paper on digital transformation in the health sector. It was a white paper which coincided with the pandemic. We have then reintegrated it with some thoughts which presented how the recommendations that we inserted in this document were even more valid in, within a pandemic context. So this is the type of reasoning that led us to study in depth some topics which are emerging ever more strongly when, it, within a pandemic. And so in this moment, we are working very hard on the next step. At the end, I'll give you a little bit of a perspective on the future. First, three short consideration on the concept of volume. This terrible COVID-19, which is conditioning for quite a while, has 200 million atoms. It's not as small as we might think. From a microbiology point of view, it's microscopic. Let's talk about volumes a little bit more. In 2020, despite the pandemic, in around the world, 59 zettabyte of data have been produced worldwide. And this is exponential. In three years, the figure will be uh, twice as much, and even more, in my opinion. But let's take another point of reference. If we were to record all the data, store, storing all the uh, atoms in the universe, we are 10th to the 80th at the moment, we have the yottabyte, which is the step further after the zettabyte, we talk about very important volumes. But the, observa the consequent co observation is, is volume value? These are the three questions that we asked our ourselves in this work. What did we learn from COVID? Certainly, remember, we had a lot of debate on the data and the elaboration of data at European level, le at national, regional level. The interpretation of the information was very different. The first thing we learned from COVID is that if there is no planification, we just navigate in the dark. Without data, even more so. Data is paramount, and algorithms also. If algorithms are constructed on intelligence system are man-made and they are not exempt for mistake. One of the fundamental issues that we must never forget is that these algorithms must be validated correctly. But we'll speak about that in my last question. What did we learn? Maybe also something positive. It forced us to do some things. As a person who works in IT and information and communication technology, I have never seen such speed in valorizing data. There has been a race, complex, difficult one, because data was pl placed here and there, to find, put together and interrogate the data basically bringing them to be to visual value. The decision makers, stakeholders, political ones, never used such data representations before in such a significant ma manner in order to make decisions. It has been an explosion due to the state of necessity. The third and last question, what must be done urgently 
because there might be f future pandemics waiting and other elements that we need to intervene quickly and efficiently. Certainly, building a data infrastructure. We are working with a specific work group whereby not go to the data infrastructure is important, but the data must be, uh, there should be a semantics of data where data is interpreting and shared in the same way amongst stakeholders. Another essential aspect we mentioned before, algorithms which must be transparent and shared. We need to understand very well what it says. Is it, do we still have a red zone in Italy, in Europe, where interpretation is highly different? And the last aspect, maybe the most important of them all, is reasoning in terms of life data, not only health data. We need to reach an improvement in the well-being of, of citizens every day, and you need to take into consideration mobility, environmental data, and making decision on data means to have this structure a data infrastructure which is shared, share the semantics of the data, and overall think about transversal data, interdisciplinary ones, which can give us a correct perspective when we need to make decisions. All this is the topic of our work with the most important element at the center, the data strategy which must be focused on standards, on the use of data, and must help us use data in a, in a wide way through an infrastructure which is adequate for our needs where data and the information that we extract from the data is homogeneous and shared with the IoT, the multiplication of information will be ever stronger and we must be able to identify important indicators, KPI, think about the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, to manage this volume of data, to identify the modifications that happen over time, we need to have an adequate data governance. Obviously, what we can't measure, we can't manage. Hence, the true step forward, I started talking about volumes, but the true step forward, forward is going from volume to value. We have been working and we're going to have a position paper on this topic, which will look at the use of data in order to improve lives which are not only important for our future, but in special situations such as a pandemic, show that they are not only important, but also necessary. So, I'm, I'll see you at our next presentation of this position paper. Thank you, all of you. Interessante intervento, quindi uh, procederei con... Uh... Don, uh, director uh, della unità di medicina occupazionale all'Università di Trieste. Prego. Bene, buongiorno a tutti. Eh, mi spiace di non essere in presenza, ma dovevo rientrare essere prima in ospedale. E, e intanto ringrazio per uh, avermi invitato. Eh, chiedo alla regia se mi dà le diapositive che avevo preparato e l'unità di medicina del lavoro che dirigo, l'unità ospedaliera universitaria e, e si occupa di sorveglianza sanitaria, quindi attività di medico competente e eh, gestisce, organizza la scuola di specializzazione in medicina del lavoro eh, di... non so se non vedo le diapositive, non so se le vedete voi ok, perfetto
Perfetto, e eh, svolgiamo attività di accertamenti di malattie professionali, e abbiamo nel periodo Covid e tutt'oggi eseguito il follow up dei lavoratori eh, dell'azienda sanitaria e dell'università per quanto riguarda le problematiche eh, del Covid e così via e, e abbiamo vari seri di ambulatori specifici, occupazionali e anche ambientali come quello dell'allergologia. Eh, la prossima e, ehm, vi dicevo, eh, abbiamo all'interno la scuola di specializzazione di medicina del lavoro con una ventina di medici, forse posso mandarla avanti da sola? Scusatemi, non riesco. Perfetto. Sì, e, eh, e inoltre eh, il, i, i medici all'interno del dell'unità dell clinica eh, sono anche coordinatori eh, del corso di laurea in tecniche della prevenzione e eh, probabilmente anche del nuovo corso di laurea in assistenza sanitaria che parte quest'anno. Entrambi questi due corsi di laurea sono la corsi di laurea interateneo, quindi sostenuti sia dall'Università di Trieste che eh, dall'Università di Udine. Eh, oltre a questo eh, ci occupiamo di tossicologia ambientale e industriale, in modo particolare per la ricerca di metalli in tracce, di nanoparticelle prevalentemente in forma metallica, in collaborazione con il Dipartimento di Chimica e il Dipartimento di eh, Geoscienze, eh, essenzialmente valutando l'esposizione in ambito lavorativo. Eh, per darvi un esempio delle, di quello che abbiamo fatto, che in realtà è, è interessante come esempio, ma che indica come eh, l'insieme delle varie eh, forze possono essere utili a chiarire eh, in che direzione andiamo per la prevenzione eh, della diffusione del covid e così via, eh, volevo portarvi questa esperienza che è eh, quella della valutazione dei eh, dei test eh, sierologici rapidi che eh, ormai poco dopo il lockdown erano stati proposti per tutte le aziende sanitarie al fine di valutare la, eh, lo stato immunitario dei lavoratori e eh, su questa base il, grazie alla collaborazione con Biovalle e, e con l'ICCB eh, siamo partiti per vedere se l'applicazione di un test rapido potesse essere utile in qualche modo identificare dei lav i lavoratori che avevano avuto il Covid o che avevano il Covid. Eh, che cosa abbiamo fatto? Eh, di fatto sono stati testati eh, per, valutando la sensibilità e la specificità di questi test rapidi e confrontando eh, questo test rapido con i test che vengono fatti in laboratorio, in questo caso il CLIA. E, eh, su questo la prima parte del lavoro è stato fatto all'ICCB in cui si è scelto il test rapido più performante e quindi eh, quello che eh, era più sensibile eh, rispetto a quelli disponibili sul mercato e, Normalmente questi test vengono eh, testati su pazienti eh, sintomatici, quindi più, diciamo più malati rispetto ai lavoratori che si, hanno malattie molto più lievi. E quindi siamo partiti dal test più performante per eh, valutare come andava nei nostri lavoratori che già eseguivano gli altri test ovviamente. E, e qui vedete il, la tabellina diciamo finale in cui abbiamo testato 132 casi di malati lavoratori, quindi sono sempre malati più lievi dei malati ospedalizzati e i, un gruppo di lavoratori che erano risultati positivi agli anticorpi ma che non avevano avuto la malattia, sappiamo ora che il Covid è asintomatico in una buona parte dei soggetti e una parte di controlli. Ora eh, Qui, vi dico, qui vedete i valori medi del, del, degli anticorpi monitorati in laboratorio e, e qui troviamo quando risultano positivi i test rapidi. Quindi nei soggetti che avevano avuto la malattia i test rapidi erano positivi nel 23% dei casi, vuol dire che eh, su 100 malati solo 23 venivano identificati. Se poi... Eh, la persona non aveva avuto la malattia, era un asintomatico, pochissimi erano i casi di test rapidi 
eh, utili a identificare una persona. Eh, inutile quasi completamente la ricerca dell'IGM che è quella che valuta eh, lo stato di malattia in corso, anche se i test li abbiamo fatti eh, alcune settimane dopo eh, la malattia e l'IGM poi spariscono, quindi non, il nostro target erano comunque gli IGG. E eh, qui vedete la performance di questi test rapidi rispetto al CLIA e ehm, dove, dove eh, normalmente solo i valori più elevati di IgG CLIA poi risultano positivi al test rapido. E in conclusione eh, siamo andati a valutare la sensibilità e la specificità eh, di questi test rapidi e trovando che eh, di fatto ci permette di identificare dei lavoratori che hanno avuto la malattia solo nel 23.5%, quindi una bassissima sensibilità, un'alta specificità perché ovviamente tutti il, il, i, i, i sani li abbiamo identificati in modo completo e qui abbiamo valutato anche con questo indice di Uden per valutare se il test funziona bene, in cui se uno il test è perfetto, zero inutile, trovando quindi un valore di questo test estremamente basso. E il risultato finale che no, abbiamo eh, la conclusione è che eh, questo test non, non è assolutamente adeguato per lo screening eh, e, e quindi non ci avrebbe dato nessun tipo di informazione. E di fatto adesso questi test sono completamente superati, stiamo parlando di eh, comunque tamponi sia saliv salivari per la determinazione del virus eh, all'interno o del cavo orale o a livello nasofaringeo, quindi eh, sicuramente i test sierologici che nel 2020, fine eh, 2020, potevano essere eh, proposti, sicuramente non lo sono, specialmente per quanto riguarda eh, questo, eh, questi test rapidi, e il, che poi non sono stati portati avanti nelle aziende da cui ovviamente come i dati ci testimoniano come eh, sarebbe stato uno sforzo inutile per risultati assolutamente non, non adeguati. E eh, su questa base del Covid abbiamo adesso cominciato oh, eh, un'altra un collaborazione eh, che eh, sui nuovi progetti che prevedono le collaborazioni di ricerca con le aziende e in cui eh, in, con, sempre alla luce della necessaria interdisciplinarietà che dobbiamo avere eh, porteremo avanti un dottorato in fisica per la valutazione della diffusione del eh, covid all'interno degli ambienti e su come migliorare la qualità dell'aria cioè che tipo di ventilazione dobbiamo avere eh, all'interno dei locali perché questi siano dei locali sicuri e anche questo è un tassello di collaborazione insomma di cui sono assolutamente eh, contenta e che eh, contiamo possa dare dei risultati in termini di miglioramento della qualità degli ambienti di vita e di lavoro e con questo vi ringrazio molto anche dell'opportunità che mi è stata data. Arrivederci. E grazie anche per questo interessante intervento e passerei... Thank you for this interesting contribution and I'd like to move on with the other next speaker and she is here with us, Lisa Vaccari from Elettra Sincotone. Very kindly, if I could see my slide. Now, good morning. I wish to welcome you here on behalf of, of the president of the board of director, Professor Franciosi, who could not be here with us. My presentation, and I'll try to keep within the time I've been allotted. Well, this presentation will deal with the activity of Elettra Sincrotrone Trieste in the field of research for health and well-being. If you don't know what ELETRA is, ELETRA is a multidisciplinary international research center. It's to be found uh, in the cast area and it's specialized in the production of light, basically. We have two light machines, which is the ELETRA synchrotron radiation facility, the round one that you see in the center, and the newer one, which is the free electron laser facility. These two light sources uh, produce uh, lights with unique 
features that are not to be found in conventional sources like uh, a wide radiation uh, spectrum from uh, infrared to hard rays, uh, highly consistent, uh, characteristics that are usually not achievable with conventional light sources and allow us to perform experiments on uh, very uh, different systems from uh, material science to life sciences. We work uh, through labs which we call beam lines and these beam lines are open 24 uh, hour uh, uh, seven days a week except when we are doing maintenance and these beam lines allow us to host uh, more than 1,000 researchers coming from all over the world in one year period. Within this context, uh, ELECTRA is basically a uh, basic research infrastructure for most of our activities and access to our facility is completely free and is based on an international peer review process. In other words, the experiment proposals come to us, they are assessed uh, by an international panel and the most qualified one can have access uh, uh, to our uh, structure at no cost. For many years, however, we have been carrying out a, a specific uh, uh, activity together with uh, the industry, and this is mediated by our liaison office. We receive uh, proposals from uh, local but also national and international companies, and we provide them with uh, services like uh, analytic measurements, consultancy, but we can also work uh, with the industry in developing marketable products. Within this context, I'd like to highlight that we also worked together with the industry in training staff and personnel, especially young researchers who then find a job in the industry because there is a request for new skills and competencies. So we have to be able to train uh, um, high school graduates or university graduates uh, that answer the needs, uh, that meet the needs of the industry. As for health and well-being, one-fourth of all applications by our users and by the researchers coming to us is to be found within the health and well-being domain. This is a very important percentage given that these centres were first developed for physics. Life sciences came later on. And the techniques that we use uh, are, m range from uh, molecular biology up to uh, I imaging of the whole patients. I don't want to bore you with all the very specific techniques listed here, but I wanted to show you how this collaboration with the industry has been going on during the pandemic. The most important example is this a case which is Escalate for COV, which is an EU-promoted project in response to the uh, pandemic. And the purpose is that of... Uh, we are also supported by a pharmaceutical company in Italy. And Eletra and other research facilities all over the world take part in this project to use uh, supercomputing capabilities and AI, thereby integrated them with experimental life sciences. The idea is that AI, as has been said repeatedly this morning, is very important for the screening of existing drugs, but then the experimental part uh, is, is fundamental and unique to demonstrate what the AI has helped us defining. Within this context, Electra has participated with its facilities, both for protein expressions uh, for COVID-19, but also for the study of the interaction between the dr drugs and the target. In general, Electra works with the pharmaceutical companies quite a lot in Italy and in Europe, possibly because there are not many pharmaceutical companies in the region. We have uh, characterization techniques for crystals, uh, uh, powders and various system and the pharmaceutical companies is especially interested in uh, different aspects of a drug especially 
polymorphism and mi microstructures of medications. And this is a very profitable uh, field of collaboration for us. Electra is the only research institution in Europe of the kind that he is uh, uh, ISO 9001 certified. This is why we are very suitable to meet the needs of the industry. Another example that I'd like to quote very rapidly, but I guess it will be quoted by the next speaker, is a type of more intensive cooperation that we launched with a local company, Halifax. There, we have uh, uh, closely collaborated to develop marketable products, so new instruments, the development of new instruments. In this case, it was iDonor, I'd won. Uh, to identify yeast and bacteria, it is an alternative, a more economic, a cheaper uh, and more rapid alternative versus uh, uh, current hospital technologies to identify bacteria and yeast. Um, if we are to use these technologies in developing countries, the, the fact that it is quite an expensive uh, plays a major role. Of course, we also had to reinvent our activities during the pandemic. My colleague Roberto Pugliese will tell you uh, how we uh, adjusted to the need of working remotely because we really had to reinvent our activities. We uh, never closed our facilities, however, and our advanced techniques were available for basic research in fields like the definition of structures, protein structures, uh, for uh, vaccine adjuvants, which would explain why certain vaccines are more effective than others. If we have a misfolding, a local misfolding of the protein, or the use of terahertz irradiation to inactivate the virus. However, I want to remind you that Electra is, with one of its beam line, is also open to patients through a clinical mammogram line for the use of very specific uh, radiations uh, that we have to study uh, mammary lesions. But before COVID, we had a strong collaboration involving the Hospital of Trieste as well in the context of lung disease. It started even before, the, the collaboration started even before, but today, we are working even more closely together to study the effect of this um, disease on the lungs. We also provide technology, we provide innovation, we provide experience to research and in the industry, Electra is an obsolete machine because it's quite old, I have to admit. And even though we're still state of the art on the market, we are uh, innovating for the construction of a new machine that can better answer to the current challenges and the challenges of the future, because clearly we've all realized that we were not ready enough to promptly react to the pandemic, and we have to be ready in the future. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We are making up for the delay. The next speaker is going to be Elvira Marchiano. I don't know whether she's with us remotely. Remotely, remotely. Asso Biotech. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank, first of all, uh, you for the invitation on behalf of Asso Biotech and to congratulate my colleagues and those who promoted this initiative, which is very important, very interesting. Thank you, thank you very much. That being said, I will try to be brief and I shall share my screen for the presentation. You should be able to see my screen, is that so? Wonderful. I was just trying to eliminate my video to have some more bandwidth. Okay. I would like to talk 
about the biotechnologies within health and well-being and life sciences to focus on what has been the evolution in recently and especially in the last couple of years for better or for worse biotechnologies have applied to the sectors of health and well-being they were able to contribute on various points of view uh, stem cells regenerative bio IT bioinformatics something that you maybe heard little of but the nanotechnology too which is another key word pre trials and cl tri clinical trials these are sectors which have enormous work lying behind them we see pro 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 things that produce by cells and cells and tissues are products that that means monoclonal antibodies recombinant proteins cell therapy we have various examples that supports our claim support our claim from an economic point of view we have seen a great growth in biotech both in the development of the financing private and public one we have more than uh, we have plus 77 percent in financing compared to previous years with very important figures as you can see from the report for regenerative medicine and this is an important piece of information here more figures the basic concept is constant growth despite 2020 the pre-pandemic and pandemic period which represented a crisis for all sectors Italy maintained in this sector an innovation perspective we see here in gene therapy therapy in 2020 especially at European level if we look at bio innovations we had a positive opinion from Emma on 45 new substances and at the following year 57 and this is quite interesting because these figures alone are not very telling but the effort behind these figures is enormous another focal point is the sizes look at the size of aspirin IGC the eukaryotic cell we go from the very big to the tiny that's why I was mentioning nanobiotechnology another concept is that of circular technology all the phases are interconnected as we heard recently also from other sectors we can no longer think about separation of phases when they are interdependent in this case we see when the product is part of the process so if we look at the previous image the importance of research especially pre clinic research and on the productive side that is we can't cells cannot be sterilized so we based in a sepsis so these are just a few aspects that show how this process is very delicate and has to be carried forward and completed in the correct manner this is the current state in as far as advanced ther therapies are concerned we are on a growth path compared to 2016 which already had very good figures we have trials which have very interesting indicators in the sector they are coherent we're not surprised by that there is a parallel on the European side with 
what is the US market because while Europe has models and people and capacity for innovation, unfortunately it still lags behind when it comes to focusing its capacities. And it's always superseded by the United States, for example, which have proven yet and, and again to know how to invest earlier and better in these sectors. Following steps. We we'll need to make many steps and quickly. We need to also have a change in perspective compared to traditional medicine, where, where we are selected for stimuli and responses, we need to be able to intervene from a genetic point of view, and this changes the state of play. We must be willing to change one's paradigm, and this is the effort that we are required, because as my, the speakers before me mentioned, we have to be ready when we are needed, hopefully, hoping that we are not needed, but when we are. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for helping us save some time. Our next speaker is Barbara Cittadini, who is a national president at IAIOP Italy. Good morning, everyone. Thank, allow me to thank those who worked for this day of meetings and comparisons on very different topics on a, in a very difficult moment that we have been living, that of the pandemic. Oh, please allow me to uh, thank the IOP president of Friuli Venezia Giulia, who invited me here. From my personal experience as a president of an association in the sector, in, in hospital sector, the per, a person who has carried out scientific research or uh, is different from that of a researcher. To, to mention just a few. But it has been quite different in health. A crisis is something that takes a very short time. But if we look at the origin of the word, it means choice. And choice means change. We have recorded a life which was different before and after the pandemic, which has changed the way we work when in private hospitals um, facilities. When the pandemic started, it, it, we were unprepared just like everybody in the hospital system was. But quite quickly, we understood that the synergy or with the public sector was fundamental if we wanted to have a complete response to the crisis. I prepared some data. I, we communicated with the Minister of Health, with the Civil Protection Service, and we offered, according to the request coming from various regions, we answered to the region the level, we offered 1,100 places, which is a good percentage from the national health system for ICU units, and 40,000, which is 22% of the entire availability of the national health system to 
manage what type of patient according to what was asked from us. In regions where the crisis was acute, like Lombardy, Piedmont, we were asked for COVID places, whereas in the other regions we were required to give space for other typologies of patients to be able to move the patients there where the public system was not able to handle the situation. This is where we offered to help. This forced us to reorganize our facilities, to reorganize them, transform them in seats for ICU, to, to transform them into places for disease, acute disease or COVID disease, it stimulated to us to become oper operative. And over and above taught us that we can work together with the public system in order to, in order to offer an efficient response for the Italian citizens. And a request that nobody was prepared for. Nobody thought that this would have not only an organizational impact, but also economic consequences. We are companies. We, thinking about the economics side was an afterthought. We had to create a plan for COVID, a COVID function and outline a plan. Our first objective was to offer our services. And we had synergies at institutional level where legislation has come to our help because some of their facilities were, were researched well, some had to close where there were no um, urgent activities. We worked well. If we are to separate the COVID period in a pre and after, what we expect is that in the design of the health system of the future, not today, in the future, thanks to the generous resources that we are going to have, we're going to be a part of a whole as we were during the emergency situation. We will continue our dialogue. dialogue. We are aware that system, the system needs reshuffling that true critical points have emerged according to various regions. We, we talk, we, there was a system based on hospitals and not on areas and a reform that rebalances the organization of, between hospitals and the areas is necessary. We're going to need some form of intermediary facilities where the citizen has to go so as not to block the emergency units. Let us not forget what we already identified in the pre-COVID period. There was an abnormal number of waiting lists which were no longer acceptable for a developed country. We, may, we cannot allow citizens to give up treatment due to that. Health mobility, I have a disease that needs treatment where I think treatment is the best, but I live in that region where where waiting lists are blocked for years. 
I can go maybe to regions where, can, where there is self-financing. All of these elements that we noticed in a pre-COVID period, nowadays has become enlarged and must be taken into consideration. We mustn't lose this opportunity to reorganize the system, not only as a reform. A reform, as I mentioned before, which is based on the hospital, but takes care of the patient in all of the various stages of the treatment. A system that needs to realize that there is a gap between the request for assistant, assistance and the response that we are that we can give. This is essential, both in public but uh, also in um, private care. We hope that thanks to the decree on um, competitivity, we can we can increase the number of facilities that offer care, but also the number of treatment services while monitoring their quality. We want to be a we want to be evaluated on the quality, not by the quantity which was um, limited within 21-2025 and in the previous period which, was, which had a limit which is old nowadays, both compared to the phenomena I have just described but also to the post-pandemic needs. So we are hopeful and optimistic. We, we're not pessimistic uh, like uh, Italians sometimes are. That this pandemic, we like the origin of the word. It's a we, we like the etymology about choice, about change, takes us to a reshuffling, a reform of, this, uh, of the structures and facilities to have investments in innovation in health, which are unavoidable, takes us to experiments between the public and the private sector and synergies, greater synergies, and going beyond very old regulations. The outlook that we see from our point of view, this is the task of my institution, is this. After I heard there is a strong push for innovation I was talking about, with, about it with the, pres, the regional president of my association. It's important to have synergies at national level for the recovering and resilience plan that offers this chance. Let's use it. Let's try not to forget what we went through and let's foster reform which is unavoidable if we don't want to be yet again unprepared for the challenges that nature has in store for us. Intervento, lascio la parola a Paolo Colifanzone. Grazie. Sì, io volevo provare. Thank you. I wanted actually to think about the future, what comes after this couple of days. We've listened to very interesting things about what we've been doing, what we're planning for the future, but I wanted rather to devote seven to eight minutes to imagine the future. How? 
Now, for many reasons, um, here in the region, research uh, was very much lively, uh, new technologies are emerging. The effects of the pandemic and the money which is coming, well, this is a conundrum uh, because the only limit that we have is the limit that we impose uh, to our own uh, imagination. The preconditions are there. As for uh, uh, supercomputing abilities, uh, big data uh, have been referred to, the size of data, the need to be able to work with this data. Now, computing abilities, we have them. I take it for granted. I have uh, more computing abilities in my refrigerator than on the Apollo 11th uh, uh, capsule. And the cost at the time was 10 times higher than the current cost of computing uh, abilities in my refrigerator. So the technologies are there, miniaturization, um, nanotechnologies, AI. The ingredients are there. Let's try and put them together. Let's try and think about the convergence between biotech and, and information technology. A, converg a convergence which is already there, I'm not inventing it, but let's try and be more extreme in our way of reasoning. Let's try and imagine which the possible development trends will be in the future. The political decision makers, startups, research institutions, the academia, and especially uh, our funders really will have to take into account these new trends. The convergence between bio and information technology uh, can be used on two different, uh, in two different ways. We can uh, move from implantable and injectable technologies to wearable uh, technologies, and we're moving from there to implantable and injectable therapies. And there are two macro areas, smart therapies on the one side, the possibility to inject and implant new uh, therapies or therapeutic systems, and smart diagnosis, that's another domain. An example is that of uh, the highly accurate uh, uh, medication, the highly accurate drug, the kamikaze drug, uh, which is encapsulated in a vehicle. This vehicle reaches the right target organ and then it explodes and the active ingredient is released. And the next step, the next step follows certain instructions uh, um, to be released. That's the next step for these uh, technologies. There are instructions for a release of the active ingredient, ingredient. And then surgery. We are moving towards the word as predicted by Asimov. Imagine the nanoparticle, nanoparticle which carries uh, systems uh, capable of performing a resection, a surgical resection. I mean, it, sounds like science fiction, but it is not. There are people already thinking about it. And, and as often happens, when you think of something, then uh, it becomes feasible. A second area, a second domain, and this, I believe, is the real future, is that of the digital twin. Digital twin, uh, not so much as uh, a place where I insert my data and, and then that place can interact with the system to uh, a fixed appointment or uh, manage my relationship with the health system. No, 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 a real mathematical model of my body, my own body, not a generic body, of, of, of one of my organs in Germany. There are those who have developed mathematical model of a kidney, let's think, uh, what could happen if you could have a mathematical model of a whole body of one of us? And then you have a sort of Dorian Gray-like uh, 
uh, model. It's a digital twin capable of simulating my own future and get the disease in my place. Because physicians then can try and manipulate my digital twin by administering a therapy, a treatment, so as to simulate my reaction to the disease. So Dorian Gray gets ill in my place, he recovers in my place, and the physician understands exactly what he has to do on me, not on my digital twin, to treat me. So this incredible ab ability to predict, is it science fiction? Yes, but it's a science fiction that it's feasible, that he's feasible. The real problem is try and develop these ideas, turning, turn them into projects. I mean, the money is there, is available. Um, certainly there is no lack for money. We only have to use them and, and channel them towards the right uh, objectives. In the light of the vision that I've given you, um, you have to know that you have to invest on many different perspectives and not just on one, because there may be wrong ones, but what counts is the right one. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution that opens up a, a, a window on the future. The only limit to development lies in our imagination. I come from a research organization, and I'm ready to buy your sentence. Absolutely. And I hope that, given the potential, there are also companies that can focus on uh, these new pioneering uh, fields uh, by developing a certain project. Maybe we could, these projects, some of them could be very promising. Now, very briefly, and we are late. And given that there is a schedule uh, that we have to comply with, now I believe that the picture that has been outlined by the speakers is very interesting and it combines uh, research activities typical of the academia with technological innovation opportunities and social and economic management perspectives, uh, management of the impact that these technologies might produce. So um, we have the opportunity to do it in the region. Maybe we should have a wider vision. We've listened to that very interesting contribution from Freiburg showing us what the academia can do. provided that there is to be a very innovative uh, climate. I believe that Trieste has the opportunity, Trieste and the region, Udine, the whole of the region, and maybe even further on, Veneto and Trentino, the Balkans, uh, Slovenia, and uh, Further on, I believe that there is the opportunity to achieve interesting results. I believe that the impact can be significant. All speakers, more or less, have highlighted a new element, a new element which is the use of machine learning techniques for all um, learning processes. Uh, learning processes based on algorithms that are more performing in, uh, for instance, vocal recognition or visual recognitions. Now, even the Color is being recognized uh, in uh, the water of developing countries, as, we, as we've heard. 
This is a technology that appeared about 10 years ago, around 2010, 2011. And this technology is, is already being massively applied. And uh, there are uh, possibilities in, in the region. Um, so, uh, again, the problem lies in the limit of our imagination. We have to be very creative and imaginative. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. I just wanted to tell you that even though it's late, we are having a 10-minute break and we resume at 12.5 in this room with research for biomed technology innovation while in the uh, 3D uh, printer lab you have to uh, climb down the stairs first door on the right you will have presentations there presentations of products and services of the companies that are taking part in this event.